Good afternoon. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here to the William G. McGowan Theater, and a special welcome to those of you who are joining us on YouTube. Fans of Laura Ingalls Wilder have read and reread her Little House books over the last eight decades. The books inspired the beloved 1970s television series Little House on the Prairie, and the series in turn has inspired another book, My Prairie Cookbook, Memories and Frontier Food from My Little House to Yours. Melissa Gilbert, who played young Laura Ingalls in the show, is here to launch the publication of her cookbook which not only shares favorite recipes, but also includes her personal recollections, behind the scenes, stories, and memorabilia. A little archival trivia for you. The National Archives has its own connection with Little House. The Herbert Hoover Library, which is one of our presidential libraries and part of the National Archives, contains the papers of Rose, Rose Wilder Lane, the only child of Laura Ingalls Wilder. Rose was the first biographer of Herbert Hoover, became a good friend of his, and her heir donated her papers to the Hoover Library in 1980. The Hoover Library website has a Laura Ingalls Wilder page with information about the collection as well as activities for children. And at this very moment, upstairs in the public vaults, you will see currently on display the original homestead files of Laura Ingalls Wilder's father and husband. So a big connection with Laura Ingalls Wilder. Before we begin today's program, I'd like to alert you to two upcoming programs. On Monday, September 15th at noon, author and historian Todd Brewster will be here to talk about his new book, Lincoln's Gamble, How the Emancipation Proclamation Changed the Course of the Civil War. Brewster recounts the most critical six months of Lincoln's presidency in which he signed the Emancipation Proclamation and changed the course of the Civil War. And on Wednesday, September 17th at 7 p.m., we celebrate the 227th anniversary of the U.S. Constitution um, by joining, you can help us celebrate by joining us for a panel discussion on the topic, the state of the Constitution, is the Constitution still working for America? Panelists include Akil Reed Amar of Yale Law School, Congressman Robert Hurd of Virginia, and Benjamin Witz of the Brookings Institute. They'll explore recent court cases and calls to amend the U.S. Constitution. To learn more about these and all of our programs and exhibits, consult our monthly calendar of events. There are copies in the lobby, as well as sign-up sheets where you can receive it by email or regular mail. And another way to get more involved with the National Archives is to become a member of the Foundation for the National Archives. The Foundation supports all of our education and outreach activities and there are applications for membership in the lobby also. And a little secret, no one has ever been turned down for membership in the Foundation for the National Archives. Our featured guest made her on-air debut modeling baby clothes at the age of two. And at seven years old, she began acting in television commercials. In the summer of 1973, the nine-year-old Melissa Gilbert joined the cast of Little House on the Prairie as Laura Ingalls and stayed with a popular series for nine seasons. After Little House, Gilbert appeared in a variety of television productions. In 1985, she became the youngest recipient of a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Her production company, Half Pint Productions, formed when she was just 14, produced the Emmy-winning television movie, The Miracle Worker, and other well-received television specials. In 1987, she made her off-Broadway debut and has starred in such productions as The Miracle Worker, The Glass Menagerie, and Bus Stop. Gilbert's legacy came full circle when she starred as Ma in the national tour of Little House in the, in the, on the Prairie, the musical. Next spring, she'll be making her return to television in the ABC drama Secrets and Lies. In addition to her acting, directing, and writing career, Gilbert served two terms as president of the Screen Actors Guild and two terms as Vice President on the AFL-CIO Executive Council, as Vice President for the California Labor Federation, as, and as the Commissioner on the California Film Commission. An avid philanthropist, Melissa Gilbert, is the President of the Board of Directors of the Children's Hospice and Palliative Care Coalition, and recently became the first ever national spokesperson for the partnership at drugfree.org. In 2009, she published her, pro, her memoir, Prairie Tale, 
and this year released her first children's book, Daisy and Josephine. And today she's here to tell you about her latest book, My Prairie Cookbook. Joining Ms. Gilbert as moderator for today's discussion is Arch Campbell. Arch has reported on movies, theater, and entertainment, and popular culture on national and Washington, D.C. television since the 1970s. The Washington Post described him as a local legend and an iconic broadcaster. He gained a following as part of WRC-TV's Dream News Team that included Jim Vance, Doreen Gensler, Bob Ryan, and the late George Michael. After 32 years at WRC, he continued work for another eight years at ABC7 and News Channel 8, making him one of the few broadcasters to work 40 years in television in the same city. Arch Campbell holds a bachelor's and master's degree in journalism from the University of Texas, his home state, and is the recipient of the Washington, D.C. Mayor's Arts Award for a generation of arts coverage in the nation's capital. Please join me in welcoming Melissa Gilbert and Arch Campbell to the National Archives. Well, here we are, and I have your new book. Yes, you do. A Prairie Cookbook. And I want to start by saying that Laura Ingalls, could she fry a chicken or what? <laughs> she could certainly make some spicy, mean chicken. I, I can fry a chicken, and it won't actually cause your mouth to catch on fire like her character did on the show. But uh, this uh, recipe and many others are in the book you've written. Yes, and they're mine. They're not, they're not Laura's. Although backstage, I was just handed a copy of Laura's dandelion wine recipe. Ooh. Do we have any of that? <laughs> after, <laughs> after her life on the prairie and crossing the plains in a covered wagon, I think she deserved a little dandelion wine. Well, Melissa, it's a great honor to have you at the National Archives. Thank and you. you are here because Laura, Ingle, Ingle, Wild, Laura Ingalls Wilder's papers are in the archives. Yes. And uh, let's start by talking a little bit about her. You played her for those nine seasons. What did you learn about her over those years? You know, I learned so much about her then and continue to. I, I, I read the Little House books. I had read Little House in the Big Woods before I auditioned for the show. It was a requirement at school and loved it. Um, and then read Little House on the Prairie when, we, when I got the role and... and um, Again, loved that and read the books as we were doing the show. I didn't do a lot of research. I was a kid, you know. Mm -hmm. I was, I was, I was sort of playing a really complicated game of dress up, a really great game of dress up. But it was, you know, it was work too. Um, I, um, I learned. I guess I learned more about what she was like, maybe on the inside, because I had to interpret her feelings through her words. I was the narrator of the show, and the show was a sh it was filmed from uh, from the perspective right. of Laura, yeah. Yeah. and so I had to sort of tap into that um, adventurous, uh, outgoing, cu super curious, imaginative uh, young woman, which wasn't really all that difficult for me to do at that age, because that's who I was. Um, I, I used to, they couldn't find me a lot of the times on the set, because I'd be off catching frogs and stuff. Just the other night, in, in I'm shooting this series in Wilmington, uh -huh, yeah. and we were at a friend's house, and a toad hopped in the garage, and everybody screamed, and I went, what? And I picked it up, and I put it in, and it peed on me, and I went, up, it peed. And they're all running away screaming, and I went, what are you, I'm just gonna wash it off. Oh, you're gonna get warts from a toad? Do you know how many toads I have lifted with these hands over the years? Even the children were like, no, no. Come on, you guys, look, it's a toad. Look how cool. <laughs> so, so are you <laughs> saying that the character actually shaped you as, uh, as the person you are today? I think so. I think really? a lot. I think huh? we shaped each other in a lot of ways. Huh. And I think the, certainly the experience of shooting the show shaped right. who I am. And being around the people I was around, Michael Landon most especially, shaped a great deal of who I am today. Um, uh, but yeah, I think, I think, you know, I probably was a, and have always been a little more timid and playing Laura made me more courageous, especially as a kid. Did you meet members of, uh, of the uh, Wilder family as you were uh, shooting and talk with them and learn I didn't then, no. Really? They weren't no, around? Uh -uh. Uh, no, no, huh. not that I was aware of. 
Um, and I would certainly have been, you know, conscious and, and aware of that if that had happened. I met and became friends with um, uh, 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 Beth Ingalls Lisas, who's a member of the Ingalls Wilder family, mm -hmm. a descendant, when I was on tour doing the musical version. Right. And then I had to, you know, during doing that show, I you had to go full. back, full circle, but I had to go back to the books and then all sorts of other research to understand what it was like from an adult's perspective. Because from Laura's perspective, it was this great adventure. When in fact it was, and she's just released the unauthorized, or mm -hmm. not the unauthorized, but the unedited version, where she sort of still, sort of, not entirely, but sort of tells the truth. And it was, it was dirty, and bloody, version. and yeah, I mean, the, she doesn't even write about the brother that she lost um, when they were uh, moving, I believe, from Wisconsin to Kansas. Um, she doesn't write about her baby brother being born or dying mm -hmm. in the books. We did in the show. And the reality was he died on the road. Uh, not even on the road, on the mm -hmm. trip. And they mm -hmm. had to bury him in the middle of nowhere and keep going. And that happened a lot back A lot. Then. A that lot of... To a, a lot of families. A lot of families. Um, single women were... Um, Single women raising children on their own were pretty common because the men were, you know, got injured and maimed and died and all mm -hmm. kinds of. I mean, you know, you could, li not to, I'm you know, like the Mr. Edwards songs. You could die from a toothache, <laughs> if well, not in your you heel, could. but you could die from a toothache then. And life was perilous. And the weather. I mean, I I live in Michigan. I moved to mm -hmm. Michigan a year ago, and I just experienced um, uh, my first Michigan winter, and it happened during the vortex. Ooh. It was. Wow. 17 below at the coldest. We had 78 inches of snow. Um, I had no choice but to prairie out and, like, you know, put on my snowsuit. And I was, I was the idiot downtown running around throwing myself in drifts of snow. And Tim and I were, you know, throwing each other with the kid. And the dogs were all inside going, what are you guys doing? It's really cold. I love that prairie out. Is that a new expression uh, for well, you? Maybe. I don't know. I, I prairie up, prairie out. Prairie dogs, that's what we called ourselves uh, on the Little House tour. We were the pea dogs. And we would have a chant backstage, and <laughs> we would pick a word for the day, the word for the show, everyone had a choice, and then we'd go, one, two, three, pea dogs, rule! And then we'd start the show. I, I, shows you what boneheads actors can be. You Good mentioned moving to Michigan, which yes. I think is interesting, because it seems like a lot of people gain success in California, and then they leave. And, uh, and how is that for you? It's the smartest thing I've done in a really, really long time. Mm -hmm. it, it's been so freeing and so, um, it's so peaceful. It's such a different life. Tim and I, um, before we moved to Wilmington to shoot this series that we're working on together, which explains why I'm not a redhead. I don't know if you guys miss it, but I miss it so much. There's still. I can't, I don't know who this is. There's I mean, a little red in there still. Uh, yeah, right there. it keeps creeping out. They have to color it every two weeks because the red <laughs> keeps coming through. Um, so but we you moved to Michigan. We, yes, and before we left for Wilmington, before we left to drive across to Wilmington to, to move into our house oh, there. road trip. Road trip. We road trip everywhere. Um, we were packing up the car and we were just sweaty and disgusting and we went to the local steakhouse which is the nice restaurant a couple blocks away to have a bite to eat and we walked in and sat down and tim said isn't it great that we can walk in here and there are no casting directors right. looking at us there's no chance of us losing a job because we look like hell in a restaurant <laughs> and there I, honest to god there's that takes a lot of pressure off you know la is a very um it's a very yeah. Difficult town, and I'm going to quote my husband. I'm going to quote him a lot just because he's brilliant. But you know, when you live at the, when you work at the mall, you don't want to live at the mall, and that's what LA is like. And I'm, I'm really tired of at 50 trying to make myself a size two because it just is not <laughs> happening. I'm, I'm done. And I, you know what? I like living in a place and being in a place in my life where my forehead can move and I don't have to f put fillers in my face and things are starting to droop. <laughs> You little. look great. Thank you. <laughs> Don't you know. I wasn't fishing. I'm no, just no, no, the reality I'm of you. maybe I was fishing a little. I mean <laughs> the reality of the fish. situation. And you know, I'm covered in mosquito bites. I'm little, like I am. I'm all prairied out. I <laughs> we had all these bruises everywhere. We had gun fights last week and 
I think they had bigger mosquitoes back in those prairie days. Uh, I will have to, really? are, there are some mosquitoes the size of Cessnas in Wilmington, <laughs> North Carolina, and well, palmetto and bugs that could actually carry me away <laughs> on their backs. <laughs> that is one thing, though. You can get plenty of work and not be in California, and Wilmington is quite a center it is, of, it uh, is, filming. It's a massive hub. I have worked more as an actor in the last year since I moved to Michigan than I did in the last four hmm. years really? in L.A., Yep, I've, I audition, uh, we self-tape for pilots and stuff. I've done a play, an independent feature film, and now I'm shooting, I mean, I'm actually a recurring role in this series. In oh, Wilmington. and tell us about the series, because you've mentioned um, it, and we want to look for it. It is called Secrets and Lies, mm -hmm. and it is for ABC. It's going to debut in the spring in the time slot after Scandal. Ooh. Yes, That's which is good. a we lovely like time slot. Here. Um, it's um, a 10-episode multi-part special event series starring Juliette Lewis and Ryan Phillippe. Mm. And uh, it's, a, it's a real whodunit it's a, that happens in the first episode in a neighborhood in Charlotte, North Carolina. Yeah. And Ryan Phillippe is the prime suspect, and Juliette Lewis is the detective, but he insists that he's innocent and goes about proving that he is not guilty by trying to prove that each of his neighbors at some point is guilty, including me. And I'm the dark, Ooh. mysterious one with the Ooh. weird bruises and cuts Ooh. and unexplained sounds coming out of her house. And, <laughs> um, and then well. each of us get a chance and our story comes out and you find out in episode 10 who the actual killer is. Um, and nobody knows. Nobody. In, oh. well, not even you? I sleep with the executive producer. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of read Does the he outline. Does talk in his sleep? No, but he lets me read the outline. So I do know who the killer oh, is. Good. And it's one of those situations where even I, when I read it, I went, I turned to him and I went, what? <laughs> <laughs> How do you do this? Nobody makes this person the killer. Does the killer know that? that, that he said, no, the killer does not know that the killer is the killer. See, I'm not even doing a gender mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. I'm being really cautious because the ABC will send Mickey Mouse over to, I'll be <laughs> done. That Mickey is, uh, he'll knife he's you in a, the front. I'll tell you, you when know, you work he's, for him, he's, he's a tough, tough guy. guy. Yeah, when he now gets we, Donald in there. I'm going to get this conversation back to, <laughs> you know, well, I'm clearly not my, getting it anywhere. My book, but I'm, so I'm go, <laughs> sorry, I'm go, sorry, Art. No, no, we're, this is wide-ranging. <laughs> We will get back to the show because I know all of you are fans of uh, Little House on the Prairie, and we will take questions. So you will have your chance to uh, to ask. Thank, about the thank show you all for coming days. out in the rain too. Which I really, really, really appreciate it. What do you think of TV these days? Oh, well. <laughs> here's the deal. There's a lot of really bad stuff. On television, there's a lot of just pandering, dumb, crappy, bleh. Yeah. And then there's a lot of amazing stuff on television. Like the, We were talking about this backstage, mm -hmm. too. There's so many great shows. And, you know, I'm, I'm a grown-up, so I get to watch the grown-up stuff now. And my kids are all out of the house. Uh, the, baby's, the baby, who's about to turn 19, is off to college. Oh my gosh. Please, you want to hear something real scary? I'm going to be a grandma <laughs> in November. Really? <laughs> My granddaughter is coming. Lulabelle Rose Boxleitner. Wow. Um, so, so back to television. Now that I've freaked everyone out and everybody's You're now doing the math. You're the kind of grandmother math. I wanted, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> well, with the cookbook, see, there's going to be a lot of baking and stuff. Um, I know everybody's doing the math going, wait, if she's a grandmother and she's not on, that makes me, ooh. Um, <laughs> Well, gosh, totally well, lost my train of thought. Where was yeah, I? We were talking about TV today. Okay. So I tend to, I like kind of obviously really well-written, interesting, but I, I tend to lean towards a darker television show. So I was, right. I, but I, I don't watch them when they air. I binge watch them and then I catch up. I did it with Breaking Bad. I did it with Dexter. I did it with uh, True Blood. I did it with, which ended, it was a dumb, the last three seasons were just horrid. 
Um, I'm very opinionated, in case you hadn't noticed. But that binge watching has really changed everything. It well, I, it really has. It, it's form. made a difference. Mm -hmm. And um, Tim and I are actually working on a number of productions. One of the reasons we moved to Michigan was to create our own film, television, good, and theater good. company and to bring incentives to Michigan and bring work to Michigan because that is a state that needs it desperately right. with the auto yeah. industry gone, decimated. How close are you? Where are you in Michigan? How close we, are you in Detroit? Um, we live here. <laughs> That's the minute. We live about a, a 45 minutes from Detroit, 40 minutes from Lance, 25 minutes from Lansing, about a half an hour from Flint, and 40 minutes from Ann Arbor. So we're, we have access to buses and trains and, and um, Whole Foods, which is <laughs> kind of important. Although I live in a farm community, so we have farmers markets, and I have friends who have bees and, and chickens and stuff. Well, why do you think Little House on the Prairie was the success it was and lasted the amount of seasons it did? Um, I think, uh, you know what, I'm going to take it beyond that because the show went into syndication while it was still on the air. Right. So it is, as far as I know, the only television series that has not ever been off the air. It, it has been on the air in America and all over the world for 40 years. This past September 11th was the 40th anniversary, mm -hmm. actually. Um, but just a few days ago. And, and I think the reason for that is because even though, you know, everybody says it was such a sweet show, it was such a great show, and you could watch it with you know, the family, the whole fa a show the whole family could sit down and watch, it was more than that. First of all, it was not only a show that the whole family could watch, but nobody was bored. There was something for the adults, and there was something for the kids. And, and the show didn't... It didn't, they didn't treat us like kids when we were professionals, and it didn't talk to kids like they were dumb in the way it told the stories. And if you recall, as you look through the, the past episodes, we did some pretty heavy stuff. Right. And, and it was all kind of based on the time we were shooting it. We were shooting it in the 70s, in the early 70s, so this is just at, about at the end of Vietnam, coming out of the... the recession then, going into the recession then. And society and was society changing was go, they were going through really so fast. many changes. Women's rights was an issue. Civil rights still yeah. are an issue. All yeah. of this were huge issues then, and it's all infused in the show. We had an episode with a Civil War veteran returning back home addicted to morphine who committed suicide at the end. Yeah. People don't realize that because they think Little House on the Prairie, they go, ugh, it's so sweet. Really? Uh, we had rape, we had uh, uh, lots of stories about prejudice against, you know, and Native Americans and black people, uh, deaths of children, right. deaths of, uh, yeah, we, it, there it was a sort of no-holds-barred show. Rape was in there. Um, and all of those stories and, and the ability of these people to survive all of that stuff, in, including everything that was going on around them at the time and having to live... Um, without, I think, is, is still timely. Mm -hmm. We're still talking about women's rights. We're still talking right. about civil rights. We're still going to war. Now we have veterans coming home with survivable injuries and, and missing limbs, and how do we take care of, and, and multiple severe brain injuries, and how do we take care of them, and how do we do what this stuff is a country? And it looks like we're coming out of a recession. We're about to go into another war. And, and, and it's changed, and things have moved along, but the issues are still the same. And I think the show makes us feel, A, comforted, and two, reminds us that it all boils down to family, love, community, and faith. Regardless of what faith it is, that's all that really matters, and that's all that we really strive for, and that's all that we're struggling for on a daily basis. And um, I think it inspires people because if they could, if that the Ingalls family could have that, then we could certainly figure out a way to have it now. I mean, technology is forcing us apart. It really is. I am so amazed. You know, I I stopped I stopped reading comments in articles written about me online oh, because it's yeah. like we call it. My husband and I call it the celebrity version of cutting. <laughs> Like, you just you read this stuff about yourself and go, what? If you Google Melissa Gilbert plastic surgery, there's just articles about all the stuff apparently I've done to my face. A woman actually said to me, to my face, said, do you know you look just like Melissa Gilbert? And I said, wait, it gets better. I said, thank you. And she said, yeah, yeah, just like her. But before she did all that crazy plastic surgery... 
And oh. I couldn't, I was, I was quiet. My, one of my best friends was there, Amanda, who's chunky eggs recipes in this book, mm -hmm. and she said, I can't, I can't, I can't. She went, you idiot. <laughs> that is Melissa Gilbert. <laughs> I think you owe her an apology. <laughs> now, I want to mention, because you mentioned this in the cookbook and in your biography, and also you're in Parade Magazine, which everyone can see tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You open the, and there you are right there on With the inside hair. page. With red hair. It's a beautiful picture, Thank by the you. way. It really is. That was is. a good day. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Well, I did this photo session uh, where they, they had the food styles, and everybody yeah. cooked all of these dishes that my uh, kids loved, yeah. and all of my kids came, and we all had this picnic outside eating this food. And the, those were just candid shots that were taken that huh. day. Well, in all three of those things, you mentioned uh, working in the 70s and kind of growing up on the set. You were, what, nine when you started? Yep. And you got into your teenage years. Nineteen when it ended. And you were doing this at a time that the whole world was changing. And I I'd like to ask you to talk about the tension between uh, your personal life and the character you played on television. Oh, my gosh. Well, my... <laughs> Gee, thanks, Arch. <laughs> Way to throw a wet I'll blanket on everything. Now. All righty then. <laughs> it's okay. I wrote about it in the first book a bit. Right. There was a lot going on in my in my home at that time. My parents divorced when I was six. My it, it was a very civilized divorce apparently, but it it was something that was just not talked about. You know, we didn't talk about feelings a lot. So we weren't allowed to, to express if we were upset about anything, and we were just told that everything's going to be the, the same. You know? And then Mom got married to this guy, and he moved into our house, but everything's going to be the same. And then his German shepherd killed my dog, but everything's going to be the oh, same. Yeah. And it was just sort That's of this, tough. you know, we don't talk about anything. And then I got to go to work where I had to feel all these feelings all the time. And that was like therapy. That was the workplace was the good news. Um, and, you know, my father passed away when I was 11, and I was working, and I guess my mother told everybody, and, and w w with Michael, the decision was made not to discuss it with me, because they didn't want me to get upset. Which, you know, now, I mean, we, I'm with my children, and I'm always going, do you want to cry? You can cry now. This is a good time to cry. I think we should cry. Let's cry. I'm crying. Don't you want to cry? Um, just because I was raised so, you know, in a family that was just so violently opposed to discussing emotions. And um, I talked to Karen Grassley, actually, uh, about this recently. Um, one of our fellow cast members passed away, which is happening more and more, yeah. Yeah. cast and crew. And she flew in. I was living in L.A., and she flew in from San Francisco, and I picked her up at the airport. We, were, we went out and had a cup of coffee, and she said, I have to apologize to you. She said, everybody told us not to talk to you after your father died. And I wanted to take you in my dressing room and just give you a place to come and let it out, which she had done about other things after. She mm -hmm. said, and I didn't. And I really feel bad about that. And I said, you know, don't. That was just, that was the way it was. And um, so it, 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 was, it, was, it was odd, you know, looking back to grow up in a family where I was asked not to feel and then encouraged to go out and work and earn money to feed, you know, showing mm -hmm. feelings. But it, I think it paid off, certainly, because it's all right there on screen. And the one who really got it out of me the most was Mike. We need to talk about Michael Landon. And, yeah. uh, and there, uh, there's almost no way to pose that question. Uh, what are your thoughts about him as, as you look back on those days? And you know, he was, he had the greatest laugh and the greatest capacity for compassion and love and now as an adult and and being married to a writer producer director and who's nurturing the same thing in me and now that I am a three times published author with I got a bunch of other stuff in the computer just waiting and I kind of started a novel um, but now looking back and and especially hearing from Tim and and realizing that Michael was able to create this incredible environment for us on the set, to be that nurturing, amazing guy who was professional, who the crews loved, and then he would go home and be with his family and still write and edit and work on the, the next episodes. I mean, that's a 24-7 job. And he did it with a minimum of drama, certainly on the set. Um, he was a human, flawed, perfectly imperfect person just like we all are. 
And um, really, I think he just wanted to be loved. So what was it like when the show ended and everybody went their separate ways? Scary, bizarre. Because I, you know, everyone perceives that, and I believe it was a close. Well, you're oh, working God, together the, nine the last, years. The last couple of days were just it was just brutal, just brutal. How long crying. did it take you to to move forward? You know, I was 19 years old, and I thought I was ready for it to end until they told me it was over. And I went, why, why? No. And um, it, was a, it was a fairly long grieving process. Um, I think I kind of huddled down for a couple of months, really kind of not wanting to do much of anything. And my, my boyfriend at the time was, was really sweet and concerned, but understood what I was going through. And then... Bada boom! I get you know my first big giant feature film, and I have to go into training and learn how to ride and do dressage and eventing and roping and I mean any kind of horseman work. I had to learn how to do it, mm -hmm. and my whole focus became the next job, and then the next job. And you know I would sometimes stop and you know I mean I, especially on the the movie that I did, I was on. I was in Texas in the beginning of it, and all these wranglers and cowboys mm -hmm. and stuff who all had worked with Michael Landon and were like, hey, so you're the kid, you know. <laughs> there you go. This horse is fast. Yeah, I got it. I, got, I can ride 45 miles an hour on a highway next to a camera truck. Put me, put me on the horse. I got it. No, I want to do it. Let me do the transfer from horse to horse. Yeah. <laughs> That's when a 19 or 20-year-old yeah. would say, me yeah. now? <laughs> do you have to even have the scene in there? <laughs> This is not happening. Um, but you know, being on a series like you, as you were, is really hard work, and and you are required to be there. You can't have a cold nope. or be sick or, nope. or, or or play hooky. Nope, I've uh, never had a. You I've were never. required to be a grown up at a very young age. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. part is kind of weird. And I don't weird. think people realize that. Nope. I think that's why, um, you know, later on at certain times in my life, I acted out a little more than I, ha I would have as a teenager because I had to work and because, you know, and getting, getting a cold is like you just get it and you keep working. You can't, you, this is a job that you cannot miss. And we should address for a second the people who uh, mistake uh, Melissa Gilbert for uh, Laura on Little House. People ask me to sign her books all the time. <coughs> Especially young, young, young people who don't realize will say, will bring the books for me to sign. And now that I'm an author of my own books, I can't, I feel strange signing her books. So I don't, I don't sign them and I have to say I'm sorry. And they say, but you wrote this. And I'll say, well, no, actually, that would make me a couple hundred years old. <laughs> and I may look at sometimes, but I'm really not 200. So no, I did, honestly, I didn't write, I didn't write them. Um, but, you know, I, I sort of feel like I'm carrying. I'm. 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 I'm kind of the ambassador for two things. Right. I'm the ambassador for mm -hmm. the television series and Michael Landon certainly and that whole legacy. Although Michael Landon Jr. is doing an amazing job on the show that he's doing, which is very similar to Little House, and I feel like a bit of an ambassador for Laura Ingalls Wilder and her descendants as well, because people now, you know, even even when they read the books. Now, some, they'll tell me that they, they read the books, but they picture me in their head mm -hmm. when they're reading about mm -hmm. her, if they've watched the shows right, first. Right. So, um, and I have no problem with that. I'm completely, not only am I at peace with that, but clearly I've embraced it. Good. Um, and and uh, I relish it. I mean, it was such a beloved image to have, and, you know, it's, it's, it's just fantastic, which would be why this thing has the word prairie in it. Oh, we're on YouTube, by the way. Oh. I don't know where the camera is, but <laughs> this is There's what you couple. always do on television. Yes, no, actually, you have to do it like Carol oh. Merrill. <laughs> <laughs> this is on YouTube, so you can go back and uh, watch it. And you can slow-mo. You mentioned training, and that yes. does bring, and the horses and the movies and the life after Little House. I think we got to ask you about Dancing with the Stars. Oh. oh, my God. What did you go through to be on that thing? Oh, How'd they arch. talk you into it? Um, you know, it, 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 they'd asked a couple times, and I said, no, not really. But I had um, I'd broken my back. 
and had had surgery and had it fixed and was went through a lot. Learn, you know, walking There's and nothing rehab. There's more difficult. No, I I I I blew out my L five S one disc and broke off a chunk of my L five oh vertebra, my God. and and still kept going for six months. I didn't know. I knew the you disc was gone. You didn't know you'd broken it. But I didn't know I'd broken it. I clearly I knew something was or wrong. Or was that part of the of your early training? That too. You'd just, just go keep on. Going. You'd just well, do and I was it. doing the show. I was doing the musical mm -hmm. at the time, so the show must go on. And so they made me a special corset, and I. Sometimes I had to leave the, the theater in an ambulance, and, and uh, sometimes I'd just walk off stage and my legs would go out from under me, and sometimes I couldn't get out of bed at all, and I had drop foot. It was, it was severe, but it was fixed, and, um, and then I got divorced and, and was, you know, went through that change and was going through that and huddled down with the kids who were grown-ups, but still trying to recover from that. And, trying to figure out what the next move was, and I got the call, and I thought, this is the time. If I can do this after healing a broken back and getting through this divorce and moving forward with my life, this is this is this it. It must it. be like going to boot camp, though. It's, How do they prepare you? Yeah, it's like going to, yeah, crazy <laughs> Schmerkowski. Joining the Marines. Ukrainian boot camp. <laughs> um, it's eight sometimes 10 hours of dancing a day, seven days a week. And it starts weeks before they actually mm -hmm. announce the cast. Um, and it started out great, you know? And, and I, I will say this for Max Schmerkowski, my, my yeah, partner and yeah. instructor. He's an amazing choreographer. He's, a, he's the, so generous of spirit and generous of heart. And we had the best time outside of the rehearsal hall. We'd have lunches together every day. And as soon as we walk in and shut the door, it'd be like, who are you? <laughs> and why is it okay to call me stupid? Uh, what? And don't you realize I'm your elder? And I mean, it was just, it, I, and the const, I just cried all the time. Because mm. I, you know, sometimes I got really mad. And um, that, that's the stuff they didn't show where I would take off my microphone and say, I'm not talking to you. I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm out. Wow. I'm outie. And then I got hurt doing that. Yeah, I know you, you had an accident. So. I did. Was I, that on camera? It was, yes. Oh. I was live, and I took Max out uh, with my head. I knocked, spun around and mm. knocked him down uh, in the shin. So maybe Didn't the, even bruise him. Don't make I got a concussion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, don't, don't make me mad. I'll hurt myself. <laughs> or, or his head. No, he's, it was my head, oh. his shin. He didn't oh. even get have a bruise, but I had whiplash and a concussion. Oh, that's no good. So I had to sit out the next day, and then uh, I was back the following day in rehearsal and just kept going from there. There's still something wrong with my left foot from where he stepped on it when he got mad at Golly. me one time. Golly. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm so cobbled together at this point. I'm, I keep thinking, a toe, really? <laughs> I've got two more discs now blown out in my neck, and I'm already fused, and I'm going through all kinds of stuff for that. So I'm, <laughs> toe, whatever. And by the way, I don't travel in these shoes. I was in flip flops, and I put these on just for you. Those are gorgeous Actually, shoes. I didn't do them just for you. I put them on for me to make my legs look longer and maybe distract you from all the mosquito I think those shoes bite. deserve a round of applause, don't you? They're really lovely. Thank you. Now, I promised that we would give some time over to uh, you so you could ask questions. And you are so easy to talk to. Thanks. That I, I'm afraid that I'm uh, reneging on that promise. So I think we should let those in the audience have their say. Sure, go for it. So now there's a microphone at both sides. And uh, usually uh, at one of these events, there's someone out there madly waving, saying, get off the stage, we're out of time. I don't know how much time we've got left, um, but I see we have two people here, and so... Don't we start how are signing we at three? Okay, so we've got about... we got 20 minutes-ish. You want to do 20 minutes of questions? Okay, 15. 15, 15 we'll do 18. 15. It doesn't look like a lot of people are all that excited to... Don't be shy. <laughs> well, this is your chance. Go. Ask me anything. <laughs> so, so I will. We... I will tell you the absolute truth. How about that? <laughs> oh. Things that were not in the book. So let's see. Should we start on the left? And uh, what is your question, sir? Sure. Hi. I, I've always wanted to ask you. My favorite episode forever was the episode, the double episode you did with Ernest Borgnine. Uh, I thought it was 
incredibly well written and you were so young and he was already an Academy Award winner. I was just wondering what it was like to work with him. Oh, he's great. He, un Uncle Ernie <laughs> was just fantastic. Um, we, uh, it was just easy. He was warm, he was welcoming and you know, I was such a guileless kid. I didn't know who Michael Landon was before I went into the auditions. I mean, if, you know, I, I, I didn't watch Bonanza, I, I watched Batman. Kidding? <laughs> Adam West. <laughs> that was Batman. <laughs> now, my friend Jennifer Garner, who wrote the quote on the back of the book, her husband is now playing Batman, so I will have to change Batman camps. <laughs> but in my heart, it will always be Adam West. Um, uh, Ernie, I didn't know, I mean, I didn't know the history of his career at all. He was just so great, and we were all on location in this little motel where we all stayed in Northern California, and it was, and it was Victor French and Michael Landon and Ernie Borgnine and me. Mm. And they were funny and wild and really just great to work with, and you know, when it came down to doing the really heavy stuff, they would focus in, and, and it was a very emotional script. my favorite episode, too. Um, it's kind of unwatchable for me because there's so much, now that Ernie's gone too, there's so much tied into it, and there's so, I have so much loss attached to it um, that it makes me sad. It makes me sad actually talking about it. But it was, so, it was just a, a fun and fantastic yet another adventure for me. And I felt like a princess there, you know, with all the guys. I mean, it was just me on that mountain with all of them. It was, it was great. It was great fun. And... Um, and an episode that I really kind of, I, I couldn't, I hadn't lost, I'd never lost a sibling. Um, but there was a lot of, there had been some loss in my life up to that point. So I, I was able to get a lot of that stuff out too, which was great. And it was so, Michael directed it and wrote it and produced it perfectly. It is, honestly, I think, and, and I think my husband will back me up, who never watched Little House on the Prairie until he met me, that the premiere movie, the pilot of Little House on the Prairie, and that are like the two best two hours of, or four hours of television ever made. That episode always comes up. Yeah, that's a big does. one. Yeah. That's a big one. All right, let's cross over here. We'll go back and forth, and you, sir... Yeah, what was it like uh, back in the prairie days going to one-room schools versus the big schools that we, we go to now? You know what? That's an interesting question because on the set, when we were filming, when we were filming on the stage, our schoolhouse was a kind of a, 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 a one-room one schoolhouse. <laughs> and then when we were on location, we filmed in the one-room. Uh -huh. we, we went to school in the one-room schoolhouse. So um, there were two teachers... And one of them was mine, and then one of them, Mrs. Meneer, taught me. And I actually, uh, she's in my, chil my children's book that got published this last spring, Daisy and Josephine, as um, Daisy's uh, tutor on the road. And there was Mrs. Fife, who I just saw. And um, Mrs. Meneer had me and Melissa Sue, and sometimes Allison, but all the time me, because I was there all the time. And... Um, it was great because there there could be either one or two of us or sometimes there were 20 kids, sometimes there were 40 kids if we were shooting school stuff. And when the 40 kids would show up, they were all the same background kids and they were all basically kids of the, cat, of the crew or relatives and friends and, and occasionally Sean Penn and his brother Chris. Um, Sean Penn was one of the few people to actually pass out on the set. Really? Yeah, from the heat, Yeah, when his dad huh. was directing. He wasn't so tough yeah, then. Uh, boom. No, I know. I know. <laughs> I know what he is deep down now. inside. I could, t I could take him on in, in, a, in a sauna. <laughs> Boy, that came out wrong. <laughs> Sorry, husband. I'm not going to I don't go mean, I mean in the, never mind. Now, how about you, young lady? What would you like to Thank ask? you for calling me young lady, first yeah. of all. <laughs> um, my question for you, Melissa, is more about the book and cooking. You've been in show business your entire life. When do you remember ever finding a love for cooking? Um, it's actually in, I think, I talk about it in the acknowledgments in the back. Um, I always was fascinated by cooking when I was little. 
And um, there's a story in the back in the acknowledgments about my, the first attempt at scrambled eggs for my mom on a Mother's Day right. with garlic that my friend had taught me. And I, I say in the thing, and, you know, she put in a little garlic. I thought, well, I'll put in all the garlic. <laughs> Three eggs. And my mom ate it all. And was, she was, bless her heart. And my, like, the first real things I cooked were quesadillas for my grandfather. And then it just sort of developed from there. And then it became cheesecake. And then it became, you know. And then, then I had my first child. And then I really started cooking all the time. And cooking for me is, is another creative outlet. I have writing, I have acting, and I have cooking. And it, it, but there's something about cooking that's even greater uh, for me. I mean, there, there, when I see my whole family sitting around a table and everybody's eating and no one's saying a word, it gives me such a great sense of accomplishment. And when the kids were growing up, the one thing we always insisted on at least once a week, if not twice or more, everybody had to sit down at the table together. And we all had to eat together. And I had to find ways to hide squash in some food because I had a couple kids who would not eat squash. Um, I actually served them spaghetti squash with a red sauce made out of squash. And mm. they ate it all and went, this is the best pasta. And I said, that was all squash, <laughs> you little buggers. <laughs> 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 Try and give me a hard time about squash. So these recipes <laughs> developed out of my love for cooking. My best friend, Sandy, who's also in the acknowledgments, is an amazing trained chef. And then, so on Sundays, all of our friends would gather together with their kids, and we would all cook together all day, and the kids would swim and play, and then we'd all sit down for these enormous meals. And during the times of abundance and, and great blessing in our lives when we were really working and our husbands were working, then we would have um, an abundance dinner where we would, you know, it was sort of a Thanksgiving, not around Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. to give thanks for, for what we had and have all of our friends come and, uh, and eat ridiculously rich, uh, unnecessary food like caviar. Um, well, not not so much caviar too. anymore for me. Yeah, well, <laughs> that was then. I had a metabolism. I don't have a metabolism anymore. That left when I turned 50. It went like later. Now how about you over here? I'm here with my best friend, Melissa, and over the years, especially in the 80s, we, I can't tell you how many times we dressed up as Lauren A. Mary. We had the bonnets, we had like the full on, we'd create all these scenes in our backyards. I, I said that to her, I was like, dude, we didn't wear our bonnets. <laughs> People wear bonnets. Used to come wear bonnets oh, it was like our daily uniform. I love it. And so we would always play in our backyards and, you know, we'd pretend to be on the prairie and all this. And we always thought, and here's my question, not just talking about me, but, you know, we did dress up in bonnets. My question is this. We always thought, I bet that Melissa and Allison, I bet when they're there on the set, they have so much fun, like, sneaking off and playing and pretending. On, did you guys ever, like, you know, stay on the set or sneak in or do anything crazy where you were just oh, playing yeah. and having fun? Oh, yeah. We did lots of stuff. We did lots of stuff like that. And Leslie Landon. Too. Did you wear bonnets like at home? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It was the seventies. It was my. I had to get away from that when I got home. That was the last thing on my mind. All I wanted to do was feather my hair too, and but you can't half pint. We can't do the pigtails if you feather your hair. <laughs> do it. We used to, to explore all around Paramount and. Um, and, uh, and MGM, which later became Sony, where we were shooting. Um, I used to go sneak over to the Robin, uh, to the Robin Williams, to the Mork and Mindy set, which is where mm. I first met Robin. Oh. And I would sit oh. in the, and I would watch him work. And sometimes the security guys would come to take me away. And <laughs> Allison would be there with me. And, and Robin would go, ah, uh, no, you guys, the pint stays. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would climb up into the catwalk. That was really a bad, dangerous thing to do at the top of the sound stages. And then one time, uh, Leslie Landon, Mike Jr., Allison wasn't there. Allison didn't do the really physical stuff. My brother and I, and I think maybe Matt and Pat Laberto, when we were shooting in another part of the town, we went up to you know where the wheel is at the mill. And um, we got in it and started running like hamsters <laughs> to see if we could do it, which is a stupidly dangerous thing to do. And then so we, we triumphed doing it. So we went back a while later, and they just shot the scene where Merlin Olsen is sitting in it, working on it. Uh -huh. And he spins all the way around, and we didn't know. We started running it, and the whole thing was boarded up. And we were like, oh! We had to start running backwards <laughs> to stop it. We would have just, I would have been bad. 
Do you know, I'm just so happy to know that there were hijinks. We knew it. We hijinks. suspected oh, hijinks. hijinks. This is I great. broke my wrist ice skating when we were on location. Allison broke her wrist skateboarding. We were, there was hijinks. And you worked with a broken wrist? Well, of course. Yeah. There's, wow. Yeah, the first question That's my mom part. asked when she got the call was, can she still work? Uh-huh. Uh, you, sir. Well, it's a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to let you know we missed you at the Walnut Grove reunion. Uh, oh. A lot of your cast members spoke very highly about everything, your work ethic and all that other stuff. Two questions. Uh, first question, since you moved to Michigan, you kind of elaborate a little bit on that, but your appreciation for Laura with, you know, um, you said the cold, the bugs. Is there any other type of appreciation you have for just what she had to go through now that you live Still in Michigan? Still living in Michigan now? It, um, yeah. yeah. I, we've got tornadoes and, and uh, all kinds of crazy things. But then on the other hand, we have fireflies. Exactly. I sit in my garden. I mean, you can't do this in L.A. You can't see them through the smog, <laughs> even if they were there. I sit in my backyard and just watch fireflies in the summer for, I don't know, an hour a day. I missed summer, too, because I was in Wilmington with the Cessna mosquitoes. Um, I... Um, I, ha I live in a really small town with a really tight community, and everybody looks out for everybody else. When the ice storm came through, everybody was knocking on everyone's doors to make sure they were okay. We didn't lose power. I reached out to a few of my friends who lived off in the, you know, far out, out, out of town. They'd lost power and said, you know, you guys can come stay with me if you need to. We got plenty of beds, and we'll figure it out. And um, that that's just, it's, it's a completely different way of living. I mean, I, we... I went through the big earthquake, Northridge earthquake in LA, yeah. and all of the neighbors, we, we lived on a cul-de-sac, we all ran out. We'd lived there for, I don't know how many years, and none of us had said hello to each other huh. until then. Can I ask just one second question? Um, okay, Allison sure. got this question quite a bit. How is your brother, Jonathan? I don't know. Okay. Um, I have not had any contact with Jonathan in a very long time. He left the family when he was 18, and I talked to him a couple of times since, and the last conversation we had was, rather unpleasant and um, kind of scary. And so I don't, I don't really, I don't know. And um, it's been a really, really long, long sort of um, journey with him. And I've finally reached a kind of peaceful place and decided, you know, that if he wants, he wants to know my kids and me, then he can find us. Thanks for asking them. Okay, I think we have time for maybe these two gentlemen over here, and then you are going to appear and sign books mm -hmm. and uh, uh, pose for selfies. <laughs> well, across the desk, selfies. I do have a plane yeah. to catch. I gotta yeah. get home yeah. because I gotta I gotta pack. My book tour starts on Monday, and I'm doing a whole Midwestern South South thing. And also, my husband is taking me to the local movie theater to see the Floyd Mary Mayweather fight tonight. Oh, <laughs> really? Yeah. What have you liked at the movies lately, by the way? What have you seen you really like? I What's your favorite loved movie so far? The, I loved the Planet of the Apes movie this uh -huh. year. I it thought was, it was phenomenal. Yeah, I thought, yeah. you know, I went in going, ugh, the Planet of the Apes movie. Have and you seen Boyhood? Was, Boyhood was fantastic. Um, the Fault in Our Stars was beautiful. Um, I... I, there, I haven't ever, really, I've been working. So I'm chance. cheating. I'm asking my own question. Yeah, what question. are you doing? <laughs> you, you get a question. I'm, okay. I'm just Hi, Melissa. I just uh, want to thank you for a great body of work that you've done over the years, and I'm really looking forward to what you're going to be doing in the future. But one of the questions I, I've always kind of had is after you finished uh, working on Little House, I'm wondering, like, the Michael Landon went on to do the Highway to Heaven series, and I'm kind of wondering, like, why maybe you didn't appear on that show, you know, just as, as a, you know, as a uh, one episode or something like that. Jeez, I don't know. They never yeah. asked me to. Um, <laughs> they never asked me to. Um, I was really working a lot at that point, so I don't, I don't know. I don't know if they, I don't know why. That's a, that's a good question. I'll have to ask Kent McRae. 
Oh. Who is Michael's producing partner? He's in. He's in. I'm gonna send him. A, I'm yeah. writing him an email. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm totally kidding. And now for our last question before um, you sign books and catch your airplane. Uh, I want to thank you very much for for taking these questions. And uh, I watched the show as a kid, and now I get to watch it with my daughter, um, who's here with me today. Mm. We, we always make sure to have like 12 episodes on the DVR, so that we always have one to watch. You, oh, you guys have to get the um, Blu-ray. The, the whole have to get show. a Blu-ray player first, but um, yeah, you can download it on Amazon too, I guess. But it, the whole series has been just re-released. Mm -hmm all in a package, all digitally remastered, and you guys have been watching the syndicated version. They cut five minutes out of every episode oh, wow. for commercials. It's all back in. Oh, so it's wow. all the way we originally shot it with this beautiful sound. It's great. I'm, I'm still uh, nudging Lionsgate going, hey, guys, where's my but nine set? I said I would do the, the back behind the scenes thing if they gave me a set of DVDs, and I still, oh. they haven't yet. Oh, wow. Guys, hello. <laughs> My question is, um, uh, what difference between watching as a kid and watching now with my daughter as an adult is I really appreciate a, a lot of the social justice themes that are in there, and particularly the labor stuff that's in there, all the episodes about the Grange, which obviously those storylines didn't involve Laura as much, but I know that you went on to be the head of the Screen Actors Guild and active in the labor movement, and that's not really a part of your biography that comes out in these things, and I was wondering how much the show influenced you being active in that realm. Well, I had not realized that connection until you just... I could not, I have, that's been a missing link for me. I've been trying to figure out what spurred that passion in me. And now I know exactly what it is. Thank you for that. My God, my therapist is, I'm not going to have to I can do weekly sessions in exchange for the Blu-ray. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. That's really, that's just, that's amazing. Because yes, Michael was very, you know, he was, he, in his writing, in the, he was very pro-labor, very pro-union, very pro-worker. And that was infused in the show, too. So there's another thing that I walked away with. Ooh, gosh, he would have loved me being president of the Screen Actors Guild. He would yeah. have loved that. And he would have also told me I was crazy for well, doing Melissa, it. Melissa, you are very generous to spend this time at the archives and to answer these Thanks, questions Art. and to talk to us. And uh, you're, you're such a warm and inviting person. And I think let's give you a round of applause. You'll be signing books. Yep. And here we go. I'll see you over there.